ever wanted to break out of your cubicle and into a business where you can call the shots? You Break Guy Fix is looking for passionate self-starters interested in a franchise opportunity in the booming electronics repair industry. At You Break Guy Fix, we help reconnect people to the devices that they rely on so that they can get back to what matters most. This is a big responsibility. And from the moment you join our family, our franchisees are provided with the resources and support to bring affordable and convenient electronics repair to your community. Did we mention that with amazing partners like Samsung and Google, you Break I Fix franchisees also have access to the highest quality parts and personalized training out there, as well as specialized tools. It's true. And it's also easy to visit youbreakifix.com forward slash franchising and learn more about your big break at your very own You Break I Fix. Ever wanted to break out of your cubicle and into a business where you can call the shots? You Break I Fix is looking for passionate self-starters interested in a franchise opportunity in the booming electronics repair industry. At You Break I Fix, we help reconnect people to the devices that they rely on so that they can get back to what matters most. This is a big responsibility. And from the moment you join our family, our franchisees are provided with the resources and support to bring affordable and convenient electronics repair to your community. Did we mention that with amazing partners like Samsung and Google, You Break I Fix franchisees also have access to the highest quality parts and personalized training out there, as well as specialized tools? It's true. And it's also easy to visit youbreakifix.com forward slash franchising and learn more about your big break at your very own You Break I Fix. Are you Fuj Fujiyama? Yes, I am. Who are you? I'm a cop. His real name is Joe Marshall. They call him Samurai. He speaks fluent Japanese. He got his martial arts training from the masters in Japan. He was brought over here from the police force in San Diego to fight us. Would you like to fuck me? You're the one that talked me into bringing this moron from San Diego to fight the J Japanese Katana Gang. Bingo. I want him dead. I want his head cut off and brought here. Have you been circumcised? Yeah, I have. Why? Well, your doctor must have cut a big portion of it off. I want his head on this piano so that every man in my organization understands once more that no Katana gets captured alive or talks. Got that? How did you know I'd come home with you? Let's just say, I can read eyes. I feel like somebody stuck a big club up my ass, and it hurts. We've got to figure out a way to get it out of there. Welcome to They Called This a Movie, testing the strength of friendships one terrible movie at a time. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and the podcast services by searching They Called This a Movie. We are part of the Main Amy Network, and to find more from us, check out the website, themainnamy.com, or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Main Amy. We are also now a proud member of Geek Vibes Nation. You can find them at gvnation.com. Welcome back to They Called This a Movie. This is Anthony Delvecchio, and with me as always is Dan Aquino and Mark Meyer. Say hello, gentlemen. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hello. Yeah, so. And uh, not a bit thing. I just want to uh, say I should always trust you when it comes to comedy as I watched Coffin Drop from I Think You Should Leave and you did not undersell it. I was crying <laughs> at my computer. There amazing. you go. There you go. I think everybody thought should I, watch at least that. Yeah, I, I thought I'd start off with some praise there you for go. you rather I, than a bit. <laughs> I will gladly take some praise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but besides coffin drop which is hilarious guys what have you watched this week well mark and i can kind of do a uh i, I guess we could tag team this one yeah uh we went and saw black widow on so night yeah all right so you saw it too awesome so we I can saw all it friday afternoon 
Nice. A little, we could do a, a menage here. I enjoyed it. I, I think it, it was, a, it was a decent, it was a good action movie. Uh, I don't think it really added anything to the MCU as a whole, really, and maybe until the very end. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, it was a fine send off for Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow character. Uh, a lot, I, I know a lot of people, I no spoilers, but a lot of people are, are kind of up in arms about a certain character reveal. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, uh, it didn't take away from the movie. Uh, I, we were joking that this movie kind of gives Fast and the Furious a run for its family money. <laughs> uh, it's all about family in this one, and um, it, it, it was a it was a good message. I I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, they were all kind of broken people, and they were all just doing a job. But at the end, it, it, there was something there, which was cool. Uh, I thought David Harbor was funny. He was a good uh, addition. Florence Pugh was awesome. I thought she it will be excellent in whichever way they choose to send her character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rachel Wise was fine. Uh, I don't think, you know, she might have been the weakest part of the movie for me. Okay. But other than that, I, you know, I thought everyone was good. Just, uh, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't want to get into spoilery territory, but sure. I'd probably give it seven and a half out of ten. Okay. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. So basically, in the same place as Dan in terms of score and ranking, um, I was just um, oh, oh, very impressed. I was trying to think of a better word um, with. Uh, uh, Florence Pugh's um, Yelena. Um, it just for a role that could have been like you know be in the shadow of of, of Scarlett Johansson um, in this movie. Every scene she was in, she did that amazing thing of just stealing it, like nailing, hitting every comedic timing just about. Um, mm-hmm. And there are some things that I wonder how much she added that wasn't on the page. Like uh, there's especially a great moment inside a convenience store. Mm-hmm. Um, where I'm wondering if the physicalness of that joke was all her or if that was on the page, um, right. you know, and because it makes that entire conversation, you know, just just by uh, the way uh, they decided to take that joke. And then um, it just I like that it she sort of has the, you know, Black Widow and Natasha, you know, aesthetic in terms of how how Black Widow fights, um, but just the different attitude, because. At times, ScarJo's Black Widow is kind of boring, um, mm-hmm. you know, and every time, you know, uh, Florence Pugh was on screen, I was I was interested. It kind of had the you know, the uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, you know, in um, Queen's Gambit sort of thing, you know, where, OK, I'm, I'm in locked in um, uh, for this scene. It's 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 going to be good. And then I think me and Dan were talking about um, how impressed we were with david harbour because it was sort of a uh, is this the right casting choice you know sort of thing when it was first announced and then for exactly what they made red guardian he was perfect um because he played that i was telling someone today he played that character with the he didn't do the uh um the uh, the thing where just because he's a soviet soldier and stuff like that that it had to be very you know serious and evil and all that kind of like Bucky um, in that sense. He was just, he was the Red Guardian. They made toys. Kids loved them, you know, like he played for more like Captain America of that side, um, mm-hmm. uh, more than just being a trained killer sort of thing. And it was, it was nice to see that they did that um, because it, it lent to the whole movie and, um, you know, and it, it also, I don't know, it, we'll go slightly, we don't go any deeper than this, but, I think part of the movie with the family stuff is uh, sort of an argument for, uh, you know, nature versus nurture sort of thing, um, since they were a, you know, um, you know, a family. Um, they all seem to rub off on each other more than, um, you know, what they were trained to do. Um, you know, it became natural when they were in a room to act like sisters and act like, you know, um, even through all the training they've been through. It was easy for them to revert back to it. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, the whole the whole idea of, of this movie is partially rooted in that. And I think that's why they they lean so much on the family aspect of it. And I would be happy with a Red Guardian cameo at some point <laughs> in in, um, in the, uh, you know, the fourth 
uh, part of this uh, MCU phase four um, coming up um, just in some dumb way. Um, but yeah, I was excited by, you know, the, you know, the, uh, where they seem to be taking Yelena. Um, and, uh, I think it makes a show that is coming up on, uh, Disney plus way more compelling to watch. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I liked it too. I, I'd probably give it about a seven. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought they're in a different universe. This is a really dark movie. Um, you yeah. know, the whole, the whole opening is, uh, if you take it out of comic book world, they're essentially creating sex slaves, basically. Yeah. Um, and that the opening, the credits, the opening credits were like really well done. It's weird for me to comment on that, but it like kind of sets up like a pretty dark world we wind up going into. Um, and obviously, yeah, you know, because of the comic book flair to it, it less dark but yeah i enjoyed it i've i've not been a big scarlett johansson fan i think she's okay um but she was good in this she you know held her own i think as you guys mentioned david harbour and florence Pugh were great and they're obviously they steal the movie which it which works to marvel's advantage obviously because this is you know for all intents and purposes this is scarlett johansson's last movie so what way better way to do that then introduce two new characters that people want to see um the, this whole thing that goes with prequels and it's you really can't fault this movie for being if because it's with every prequels like you know at least the fate of your main character is going to be just fine it didn't really take away from the movie for me um as you mentioned mark uh, dan the one character uh does you know is limited um in the Avengers, it would in an Avengers movie where that character interacts with more Avengers, it would be more interesting to see because it you would see that power fully on display. And this one, you really only see it interacted with the one. But it was good. I enjoyed myself. Uh, it was my first movie back to theaters. Wow. So it was great in that aspect of it. Um, so I had fun. I also saw this week, I also watched Fear Street 1978. I think this is the second one, which was good. It's like uh, set at a camp. So it's got kind of Friday the 13th slash sleepaway camp vibes to it. Um, that was fun. I also watched Bill and Ted face the music, which is now on Prime. Or who oh, was that? It was, you know what? It was enjoyable. It was fun to watch those guys. It's such a positive, you know, the whole, every, each movie is so positive <laughs> yeah. that it was just like, you know what? I wish I had seen this in the middle of the pandemic. So it was like, you know, this is this put a smile on my face. It um, it really hit the it was right place, right time. But it was I enjoyed it. Um, the two the two girls that play their daughters were really good. It's uh, Samara Weaving plays uh, Bill's daughter. And uh, I don't remember the name of the, the Billy Joe girl. Logan or something like that. Oh, as her character name. Oh. I, th- I thought her actual name was like something Logan. I'm not sure. I know. I actually, I I don't want to get this wrong because I believe the person that plays Ted's daughter is non-binary. She's okay. in the show uh, Atypical, or okay. they're so they're in the show. They're they are in the show Atypical. Is it is it Billy? Is that her character name? Uh, I do not have it up. I'm. I have um, IMDb. I'm just okay. Asking. The brunette. Okay, so that would be Bridget Lundy Payne. No, oh, I, I knew it was a three three part name, but I was yeah. way off otherwise. I might be mistaken, uh, but thing, yeah, she's an atypical, but she was really good in it too. I nice. keep saying she, but I'm not con- I'm not a hundred percent positive on on the pronouns, so it's, I apologize it, if I'm being incorrect. It, it's funny that like you mentioned how you wish you had seen that in the the middle of the pandemic, and because they're so upbeat, that's kind of it's kind of something that all of those movies are. It's just like no matter what's going on, even in Bogus Journey when they die, they're just so upbeat about everything. And it's it's kind of weird because I think a lot of people overlook how just happy go lucky. I mean, they're they're dumb these mm-hmm. guys, but they're they're just so resoundingly happy. And it's like yeah. oh well, you know that's that's always a cool message. Like you got your best buddy with you. How bad can life life be? And it's something I think those characters, I wish they would have had a bigger this movie would have had a bigger opening 
because I think a lot of people could have used that kind of uplifting uh, message. Yeah, yeah. And Bridget Lundy Payne goes by they, so apologies yeah. misusing pronouns. But yeah, they are good in the in the show in the movie too. They're good in Atypical. We were all also started watching that too because that came back, and my wife loves that show, which is not a bad show at all. I don't know if you guys have seen Atypical. No, not yet. Not yet. I, I watched uh, Memoirs of a Geisha, which okay. is similar. completely different. It's very similar, actually. <laughs> oh, is it? Were, were they sold into uh, slavery, I guess, in uh, World War II Japan? Uh, only Michael Rappaport's character. Oh, okay. I thought I had read about that. <laughs> that you know, that was a bold direction for that show to go into. Uh, but, uh, you know, I heard it paid off. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, I, I love like, Japanese culture is really cool. And uh, it's very unique and very beautiful. But, oh, my God, like the stuff that this poor girl had to go through to where where she became she becomes a geisha is just, uh, yeah, it's not great. They they definitely take a huge advantage of these poor girls. And uh, it, like we were talking about Black Widow, where it's almost like sex slaves that happened in that movie. And it's uh, excuse me, it's kind of jarring. But the movie itself is it's such a beautiful movie. Uh, it's shot so well. Uh, Ken Watanabe's in it. He, I love Ken Watanabe. Uh, the actor who plays Shang Tsung is in it. He's nice. kind of a creep, which you know Shang Tsung. So there, yeah. there you go. But uh, oh man, it it I don't know if you guys have seen it, but just the the cinematography of that movie is so so beautiful. Uh, there's a dance scene. Uh, there's a dance scene where the main character has to perform at a very, I, I guess, in front of a large clientele. And it's almost like she's dancing on water. And the way they portray it is just awesome. So great movie. I highly recommend it for anyone who's into that kind of cinematography. And if you like Japanese culture, it's it's great. Directed yeah, I, by I, Rob Marshall. Yeah. I, I have one more if you're done, Ant. Yep. You watch. Yeah. So... Um, Kind of like Dan with his Dane Cook um, thing. Um, oh, no. I've started on a uh, Florence Pugh kick and watched Fighting with My Family. Finally, That's a little better after, than Dane Cook, I'd say. After seeing it in my uh, uh, Prime feed for months and finding out that it was not on Prime when I looked for it this time, it's on Hulu. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got to say, again, she's probably she actually she's probably the second best part of this movie. Nick Frost is amazing in this movie. Um, playing her father and mm -hmm. he's he's so good um like at times it was like really stilted dialogue at times but anytime he had oh, just about a, a, a quick line or like a, a comeback it, it always made me chuckle and sometimes i'm like why did i laugh at that that was really like a dumb dumb line um but the, the funny parts there's two things which comes from me being an actual wrestling fan is one florence Pugh is not built like page at all um Page is more tall and lanky, mm -hmm. so it was it was you know it, kind of funny them trying to do uh, certain things Page does. It just works with having you know longer limbs mm -hmm. um, and just doesn't work. And two, I don't think they know how time works in this movie um, because the end of the movie um, gonna gonna spoil it because if you haven't watched it by now, you're probably not, and you already know how the movie ends if you're a wrestling fan. So they. You know, they show the you know whole family watching her win the Divas title on Raw at the WrestleMania 30. And um, if I'm correct, I believe it's four years from the time she gets taken to Florida to winning that title. And in the movie, her brother's baby is still a baby. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm guessing you're assuming a good majority of people don't understand that literally the baby is still like under a year old. And there is no possible way all this could have happened in a year mm -hmm. <laughs> in there. Like even, um, you know, even in wrestling terms. But yeah, that was the one thing that got me at the end. I'm like, really? They couldn't just have the kid be a kid. Like, you know, there, there's millions of, uh, they have a wrestling school and they're, they've hired a ton of like kid extras in there. And you can just have like a four-year-old like sitting there, <laughs> you know, it, mm -hmm. it just, um, that's one thing, not just in this movie, but most movies when, you know, time doesn't seem to be a factor. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was just funny. But the, the movie itself is a quick watch. It's probably a good seven, six and a half, something like that. It's not great. It's very, you know, 
obviously sanitizes, you know, some of the wrestling stuff and tries to hide the business a little bit, um, despite giving a lot of it away. Um, so if you're a wrestling fan, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and I am on to Midsummer. <laughs> oh, so. I can't wait to hear about that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little Poor bit different, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, all we watched this week. So we will be back uh, while you guys listen to some ads so we can pay those bills. We'll be back in a second. Streaming only on Peacock. What do you know about Dr. Dunch? He was charming, intelligent. My patients mean everything to me. Based on the unbelievable true story. I can't make sense of it. Dunch has two deaths that we know of. The state of Texas has executed people for less. It's like he knew what he was supposed to do. Then he did the exact opposite. Dr. Death. Starring Joshua Jackson with Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin. I am going to fix you. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. Streaming only on Peacock. What do you know about Dr. Dunch? He was charming, intelligent. My patients mean everything to me. Based on the unbelievable true story. I can't make sense of it. Dunch has two deaths that we know of. The state of Texas has executed people for less. It's like he knew what he was supposed to do. Then he did the exact opposite. Dr. Death. Starring Joshua Jackson with Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin. I am going to fix you. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. What do you know about Dr. Dunch? Based on the unbelievable true story. I can't make sense of this. Dr. Death. Dunch has two deaths that we know of. Starring Joshua Jackson with Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin. I am going to fix you. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. And welcome back. And now it's time to get into this week's movie. And this week was Dan's pick. So Dan, why don't you introduce this week's movie? Okay, so after our last... Uh, quote unquote movie that we watched double down uh, you know I wanted to get in on the action here because I was like you know what if Ant could do that I gotta <laughs> I gotta really set my game up and a friend of the podcast so this is more of like a listener uh, suggestion uh, a listener of the podcast uh, mentioned Samurai Cop from 1991, apparently, although with the quality of this movie, you, you could have fooled me because <laughs> I, I honest to God thought this was in the 70s. That's how it, it was shot. It's so bad. But yeah, that, that was my pick. Samurai Cop from 1991. So uh, I just give a quick shout out to Guy. Thank you very much for the the suggestion and and that is his name it's guy i'm not just saying thanks guy <laughs> you suggested this his, his name is guy to- totally real person guy <laughs> incognito <laughs> uh, all right so where are you guys coming from with it oh man where am i coming from uh this movie was pure shit <laughs> um yeah I, it's fun but it's it's really slow and I kind of figured because I was told that this like Riff Tracks had done an episode on this. I think Red Letter Media had also done an episode. So yeah. I figured like, oh, this is probably going to be chock full of good stuff. And and it is. But it kind of takes a while to build up. Uh, I don't know what to think of this movie. It's just everything about it is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the, the, the casting is wrong. The. The, the dubbing is wrong. The action is wrong. The story is wrong. It, it's just it feels like this shouldn't exist in our timeline. OK, <laughs> this should be in someone else's timeline, like the wrong timeline. This would be like the best movie ever there. <laughs> what about you, Mark? Um, outside of the discussions that uh, Dan has had at multiple parties about this um, movie, um, I have no idea what I was getting into. And uh, I was very bored in the beginning, as we'll probably all say. I think at some point there was like no music underneath any of it. And it would that just completely takes me out of a movie. Like no ambient sound, no nothing. It just um, it just made me very bored. The, the hospital scene in particular um, in the beginning, which also made me laugh because they go from what's supposed to be a hospital to clearly running out of a condo in Los Angeles um, at, or maybe even like a park in motel. Um, that's supposed to be a hotel, I mean, a hospital. Um, I did enjoy, um, uh, some of the, um, real dumb, uh, uh, ways they tried to be really clever with the dialogue and all of it fell flat. Um, and you can tell it's from a completely different era of, um, 
you know, Joe Grading, especially because um, some of these things, um, you know, would would. Uh, well, they get groans probably back then, too. But, um, you know, they just go to the well too often, um, especially dick jokes um, in there that aren't particularly funny. Um, and I had a countdown in my head of um, the fourth woman we see in this movie and whether or not we would see her boobs or not. Um, because we had seen every other female character outside of this character's mother, um, (laughs) had gotten naked at some point in this movie. And, uh, yeah, it, it made me think that is, was this a soft core porn? That's like, like in a very, very, um, you know, mild X way. Um, just because, you know, the, the, as gratuitous as the scenes were, it just seemed like getting to them, like made no sense. Like, it was like, oh, he has this girlfriend that he flirts with, but he's also trying to have sex with every other girl in this movie. Um, because Mark, he's when the you're hot yo- cop. when you're absolutely yoked like he is, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to try and fuck. Yeah. Or, or people are going to try and fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. Until she sticks her hand in her pants and yeah. not likes what she feels. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because, you know, the doctor took too much off the circumcision, um, which <laughs> probably which probably sounded a lot better on the um, when they wrote it. But um, I I don't know this this I was at times I I was wishing I was watching Double Down <laughs> at moments in this movie because I had more fun throughout that movie than I had watching. Sure. I think there's going to be a, like if we have a timestamp or like a it's a, a moment of time. It's going to be this for this podcast. It's going to be before Double Down and after Double Down. <laughs> uh, Samurai Cop for me. Uh, there's there's no propulsion in this movie. And part of that is that there are scenes like that don't have any music, as Mark had alluded to. Well, there's also all the scenes. There, there's a handful of scenes that just don't know when to end to the point where they didn't tell the actor that this that the camera was still rolling. At the very least, uh, the stunt man didn't know whether or not they were still filming while he was on fire. And then the police captain uh, thought he had cut before he had cut. Yeah, these there's there's so many scenes that just hang way too long. But it's it is fun. It does, it is weird and stupid, and half of it is the production of this movie there's there's moments where it seems like the guy gets it the director like there's some shots that are like oh well you know this lighting is interesting here apparently he had no lights though so um but then there are others where you know it's way too bright of a scene (laughs) to the fact that it almost looks like a, a a aesthetic choice but really he's probably just i can't I, I just let's just sh- throw all the lights that we have against the wall and see what happens. Uh, uh, yeah, it's weird. It's a weird one. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. Uh, the acting is not good. For the best actor is Robert Dar in this movie, and that's never a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I don't really know what more to say about it. There's so many awkward conversations that happen in this movie. Yeah, it, it, especially between like I found some of the most awkward ones were between the samurai cop and his partner mm-hmm. because they kept mentioning how like he's he, his ass is black <laughs> and like yeah all right he, yes he's a black guy but like why are we drawing attention to the fact that he's black mm-hmm. right I don't I didn't yeah. understand it and he was like yeah he was playing along with it. Like oh yeah the 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 the, uh, the the chief is going to charcoal my ass black. Like, don't ha- you don't have to worry about that. It already is. I'm like what? <laughs> uh, he does have some, his partner has some of my favorite moments, and most of it's the reaction shots there when the nurse is talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's like what is going? Why are we cutting to him? Yeah. I think part of the awkwardness too is the fact that all. Basically, all the audio is 80 yards, so the timing's off, I feel. By a They're mile. Like, yeah, so, like, the conversations are feeling very stilted compared mm-hmm. to what it would have been like if they had captured audio on set. Uh, so, like, even conversations between those two guys, which it should be, you know, more fluid, is just line and then line <laughs> and then line, you know? 
But to be, there are some great lines of dialogue in this movie. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorites is when uh, the s- samurai cop. What uh, I gotta remember what his name. Samurai cop is Joe Marshall. Joe. So Joe Marshall uh, fights a goon and he gets the address for Okamura. Mm-hmm. So the guy's like, oh, you know, like he lives here, I guess, right? And it, it just like all the cuts are like smash cuts. Mm-hmm. There, there's no transition. It's yeah. terrible. I mean, the movie opens with a smash cut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he, th- they're outside of Okamura's house, and one of the cops, uh, one of the cops says, "How do we know this is the actual address?" <laughs> <laughs> and Joe says, "If this is the address, we'll arrest him, and we'll actually have, you know, we'll have a case." against the big bad guy but if it's not we'll just apologize and move on left that out <laughs> that whole scene um has that moment and my other favorite moment which is when he's trying to open the sliding glass door <laughs> and obviously someone locked it so yeah. they had to cut away until someone unlocked it <laughs> so that he could open it it's correct yeah uh, it's like I you think that he would like kick kick the door in because he's not, like he's having trouble with it. It's like what? Well, obviously you did, didn't you think that he would lock the door if he's about to go fuck? Right. Uh, and then it's it just the opens. Door. Yeah, and then it just opens. I was like, "Oh, well, that's weird." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, another one of my uh one of my favorite parts is uh <laughs> They're in the beginning. They're being followed by a helicopter, right? So they're 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 basically on a drug bus, and uh, Joe and his part partner Frank are communicating with a, a, a Peggy, right, Officer Peggy. Peggy, and Peggy's in a helicopter. So they they get the bad guy, uh, and Joe and Frank are outside. <laughs> the helicopter's above, and Joe is just like having a casual conversation with Peggy with, <laughs> with, with no headset, no microphone or anything. It's, it's like basically he's not even yelling at yeah. the helicopter. Like, Oh, I'll, I'll catch you back at the, uh, the, the office. And like you can't hear. There's no yeah. way that she could hear what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Cause she's on the, she's on the mic and she's like, congrats guys. It yeah. calls for a celebration. And he's like, I'll meet you at your place tonight. And then yeah. he gives like this really weird face. Like, <laughs> he does it oh man he has a great face when <laughs> in the car it, like they're they're following the van in the beginning and he tells her you know like keep, keep it, it warm, warm. <laughs> yeah and he's like as long as you get it up you know, i'll get it up and then he winks <laughs> I, think, I think he's winking at us <laughs> he's either winking at us or frank or frank right but he's it, it was a very smooth wink <laughs> Like, yeah, like I'll he was, the... yeah, like he was winking at Peggy, but she's in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, it's such a great moment. I, I fucking lost it. He's driving. He's like, yeah, I'll keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a funny, funny wink. Because he's, they don't show who he's winking at. <laughs> <laughs> that dude's a fucking ham, man. Oh God. Even yeah. like his, even his face when the nurse is coming on to him, like oh. he's just like. <laughs> what does he say? Uh, oh, she asks him like, "Oh, do you like what you see?" And this is like completely out of left field, folks. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. they're 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 coming out of a burn victims <laughs> room. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she's like, oh, "Well, I'm horny now." Right. Yeah. Well, they're still in the burn victims room. Yeah. <laughs> They're about they're walking out when this all happens. She has a very specific kink, and it's yeah. people that are covered with third degree burns. Yeah, she's like, first, you like what you see? Like, yeah, I like what I see. Like, you want to touch what you see? Yeah, you want to <laughs> fuck? And then he, like, you want to take me out to dinner or something like that? Right. Then you want to fuck me? And then, yeah, and then, like, and... he takes the stethoscope. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> says it in stethoscope it's a smooth move but and like while that's going on like anthony you were saying earlier frank is just making these fucking ridiculous faces <laughs> they keep cutting to him like Ooh, yeah. oh they're just, it's like they are just put a camera on him and it's like oh give me a sour face <laughs> now give me intrigue now pensive <laughs> I was like, what oh, are you going to use these for? Ah, oh, we'll figure something out. Oh, man. And, and, like, in between all of this bullshit, there's 
a quote unquote story playing out. Yeah. And it's it's such a boring story. But the things that happen around it is really what drives this movie. Like yeah. the, the story, the plot, you don't even have to worry about the plot. No. Because you're gonna be too busy just like you're gonna be amazed at how Joe uh, uh, Joe Marshall, the the actor with Matthew Caretis, how he acts and mm-hmm. his terrible wig and Robin, that is sometimes there, sometimes not there. Yeah, it just <laughs> it, it it fluctuates. Uh, and I don't was was the bad guy actually Asian, by the way? Uh, uh Cranston Camaro. Uh, so he okay, he was. Yeah. Because he he you know I don't want to sound like that, but he was like. I don't know if he's Asian or not. Yeah. I Robert Tadar definitely isn't. <laughs> no, no, he, he yeah. was not. I, I was going to say, I love how this movie about samurai and martial arts ends with the two whitest guys in the movie having the final battle and talking about Bushido. Oh, God, the final battle. <laughs> the final battle. The when two he, worst martial artists in the movie. When he snaps Robert Zadar's neck and he can still move. <laughs> I don't. Did anyone tell Robert Zadar like, yeah, listen, that's not how this works anymore. You're right. you're essentially dead now. And he just gets up. He's like, oh god, just, that's not how things work. See any other movie in existence where someone gets their neck snapped? <laughs> they don't walk away from it. Yeah, it had me questioning whether or not his neck was snapped. Right? Or did he give him just like a really mean, like you know, like noogie kind of thing? You know, yeah. just huh. like, oh, all right. I guess I'm good. Or like maybe he just didn't know what how to react to that. Or yeah. he in in wrestling terms, he, he wasn't taking a bump essentially. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'm not doing that. That's not how my character's going out. And can and can we talk about the completely out of place character in the restaurant playing the waiter? Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> they to, that it feels that like scene, he's in a whole different movie. That scene could have shaved four minutes off this movie. Yeah. I, it it it's set I feel like that character set gay relations back 20 years. Yeah. It, it It is such a stereotypical gay person. And it's like, that's really kind of shitty how they, they portrayed it. And, and it was ugh. also a shot at Hispanic people. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're the Cuban, right? Was he Cuban? Or Costa Rican? Costa Rican, yeah. yes. And this is like, oh, man. It's it's so cringeworthy how he reacts like, like he loves cops and uh how he's basically he's trying to get Joe's number so, or no uh Frank's number right um I don't remember if that was it um I don't remember yeah. that was, yeah. when when they're questioning him he's he's asking like where he lives I think in yeah in 2021 uh, him and Joe definitely fuck <laughs> maybe <laughs> <laughs> he's he's Joe's banging everybody else I don't see why not he was like. <laughs> Sure, I have a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the and the the scene where Frank kisses the chief on the forehead. Yeah, <laughs> I that was kind of out of everything's just out of left field. <laughs> yeah, it seems like they left the joke takes in at times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, I I think another another great part is uh when they're leaving the restaurant and Robert Zadar sends his goons after Joe and Frank, but he does it one at a time. And gives them this little head nod. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know what to do. You know what to do. And like, yeah, why Why are you sending them one at a time? Just send them all, right? <laughs> and then he kills them. It's the code, man. Oh, the, the code of silence. <laughs> the, uh, there's that. There's there's Joe apparently being fluent in Japanese, but not right. knowing Ukamara or Kimuro's names. Yeah. Tamagashi, Yamagashi, whatever. You know, like that's your Japanese guy. <laughs> I think that I don't. I think he kind of gave himself away there as a bullshit artist. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Samurai Cop from 1991, directed by Amir Shravan, the Iranian director, also known for Hollywood Cop and Killing American Style. It stars Matthew Caritas, Robert Zadar, Mark Frazier, Janice Farley, Melissa Moore, Cameron. Gerald Okamura, Dale Cummings, Cranston Komaru. IMDb score of 4.6, a Rotten Tomato score of nothing. There is no score except for a 47% 
audience score. Could not find budget information, but it got a box office of $384,000. But half of this movie is really about the crazy things that uh, Amir Shirvan decided to do and how he uh, shot this movie. Um, He could not afford lighting to shoot at night, so the entire film was set during the day. Actors also wore their own clothes and drove their own cars. Much of the film was shot without sound and done with single takes. Siobhan had to dub voices months after production, but could not get many of the bit part actors to return. So choosing to use his own voice, he warped it in post-production to sound different. His lack of ability to do this correctly resulted in ADR with a heavily robotic sound. Both lead actors, Hannon and Fraser, also supplied much of the voiceover in the looping process. Uh, Hannon has stated in an interview that Amir did about 80% of the ADR voices. During these ADR sessions, Amir would film much of the necessary pickup shots, all from within the office. This is why many of the inserts of Frazier and Hannon in the film seem to be shot from the same corner of the office, which doesn't match with the rest of the locations for any given scene. Um, also, he, the fact, as we mentioned, he had uh, Matthew Caritas or Hannon. He goes by Mark Matt Hannon in this film. But uh, he wears a wig through parts of it, and it'll shift from... In the middle of the scene, he'll be wearing a, a wig and then not wearing a wig. That's because uh, he had cut his hair after he had filmed the movie. And then seven months after the, the film, uh, Shervan decided to do pickup shots. So he cut his hair um, and they had to find him a woman's wig <laughs> to use. It's so noticeable. It's so bad. And he yeah. when he wears the hat over it, yeah. it's even worse. <laughs> He looks so dumb. Yeah. Uh, lead actor Matthew Caritas cut his long hair very short seven months after filming Wrapped. While he was looking for more acting work, director and screenwriter Amir Shravan called him back for some reshoots. Shravan was furious that Caritas had cut his hair and immediately went out to look for a wig. Fortunately, Shravan was only able to find a woman's wig that looked nothing like Caritas' long hair. He agreed to wear it, assuming Shravan was going to do some long shots and pickups. Shervan still had half of the movie to shoot, completely out of chronological order. As a result, Caritas' character's hair alternates between his natural long hair and an obvious wig. The wig even comes off a few times, revealing Caritas' short, real short hair. Yep, this one's yeah. a this one's a keeper. I I, I liked <laughs> when you're talking about the ADR being dubbed. Like all the henchmen, whenever they get hit or shot, it's the same voice. Ugh, <laughs> ugh. And I, so I guess it was hit, the, the director's voice doing the dubbing. Yeah, probably. Oh, man. It's it's the worst ADR I've ever heard. Yeah. Oh, it's so bad. I can't believe they couldn't get anyone else to do the voices. <laughs> Just like anybody. Just anybody, yeah. Like, oh, wow. It, it, there, I remember a scene, a particularly bad scene, when they're in the photo booth or like the... What, they're, the photo lab, yeah. The photo lab. And the, the gang members come in. They hit the alarm and the I get the um, the photographer or mm-hmm. the, the lab technician is is talking to him like, hey, are you expecting anyone? No. There, meanwhile, there's a loud alarm going off. Are you expecting anyone? No. Well, that's the alarm. Oh. <laughs> <What the? laughs> but the ADR, it's clearly not the lab technician speaking. Yeah. Because his voice is, is uh, first of all, it's off by like just a few seconds, like a fraction of a second, I guess. But it's not him. You can tell his voice is super deep and it's off. And it's just like, I can't believe how terrible thing, like how bad could things have possibly been where you couldn't get certain, just like little things like that. Right. Right. I don't know. Uh, you guys want to get into the plot? Yeah. Do it. <laughs> uh, Dan, what do you got for us? All right. Uh, real quick. Going to give a shout out to our friends Tia and Brittany and their podcast, The Top Ten with Tia. It's a weekly podcast where Tia and Brittany run down top ten lists. You can follow Tia at TC underscore Stark on Twitter. She's also the head writer for Geek Vibes Nation. She writes some great articles. Uh, she covers uh, a lot of movie reviews. So if there's you're on the fence about a movie, go to Geek Vibes Nation. Check out her review. Hopefully it'll help. And uh, give her a follow. She's a good friend of the podcast. All right, great. And we are going to take a quick break. And you are going to listen to some messages from friends of the podcast. And we will be right back. Hey, everyone, this is Steve. And this is Adam. And we're part of the Hop Nation USA podcast. Pittsburgh's number three craft beer podcast. Join us every Friday for new beer reviews. We'll talk about the news, history, and homebrewing. 
Plus, we'll sit down with the best brewers and industry personalities that'll have us. So whether you're a casual drinker, a hazy boy hophead, or even if you're a whale hunting cellar hoarder, just search Hop Nation USA on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher and join the nation. Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. It's me, George, from the best little horror house in Philly, the show where we talk about the best horror movie ever made, according to our guest at least. We've talked about groundbreaking classics like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Alien, but we've also got a lot of great ones coming up, including some very fun guests like Len Kabazinski of Swamp Zombies and Red Letter Media fame, Caroline Williams, the star of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and Chase Williamson from John Dies at the End. So make sure you're subscribe to the best little horror house in philly and i'll see you boils and ghouls over there and welcome back now it's time to get into the plot for samurai cop we open as a japanese gangster discusses plans with robert zadar i did not write down robert zadar's name he is ill in my notes robert zadar um there's tension among the gangsters and the boss fujiyama is making a big push to take over businesses and is willing to go to war with other Japanese gangs. It's the way of the katana, we hear. So Zadar and some goons go to talk to another leader to see if he agrees with Fujiyama taking over his business. He refuses and then gets stabbed with a machete for his troubles. I, I, like, then. I like when he stabs him and just casually steps out of the frame. <laughs> yeah. It's like, stab, and I'm, I'm done here. <laughs> Then we cut to police officers Joe Marshall and Frank Washington set out to respond to a tip regarding the Chinese gang leader's death. As they head out looking for a blue van in the car, a female cop Peggy is in a helicopter. And they all head to the pier. And Peggy's keeping it warm for Joe, apparently. <laughs> what, what, what is she keeping warm? I have no idea. I couldn't remember. Well, I'm assuming it's an innuendo. <laughs> yeah. But, you uh... Think? Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be my guess. Yeah. And which is kind of unprofessional, you know, because she's not flying by herself. There's an actual pilot there. And I'm assuming the pilot hears this. This is really embarrassing. He's probably but the only one that hears it. <laughs> for, yeah, but apparently, like, I, I'm assuming Peggy just likes being the, like, the precinct slut, I guess. <laughs> right, yeah, because she asked that one, she asked that one guy if he wants to fuck. What if he said yes? Right, just out of nowhere. Hey, preacher, we got nothing going on. Want to fuck? Shut up. I love his his response. Shut up. <laughs> God, enough of you. Yeah. Uh, what if he said yes? What if the preacher like, yeah, you're pretty aren't, thick. Aren't they in the middle of a of a bust, by the way? Yeah. That's what all like. What, what do you mean you've got nothing going on? Right. <laughs> your your coworkers are putting themselves in immediate danger. You have a yeah. lot a lot going on. <laughs> Uh, so they're expecting a coke drop off and the blue van stops and they meet up with some guys on a boat and the hand off is made. The blue van loads up and heads out just as Joe and Frank make it to the pier. So a car chase ensues. As Joe and Frank get closer, the back of the van opens up and one of the gang members starts firing a shotgun at them. Frank returns fire and the guy is hit and Joe winds up running him over after he falls out the back of the van. Not even trying to avoid him. <laughs> but, he, but he looks really upset that he did it. Yeah. Hey, oh, man. <laughs> After that, Joe keeps telling Frank to shoot the next guy in line. Shoot him. Shoot him. Oh, that was so shoot. annoying. Shoot he him. He says it 20 times. The same exact way each time. <laughs> we know. Right, like, I found Frank. I'm like, I know what to do here. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right, all right, Aunt, run that back one more time. Let's hear it. Shoot him. All right, shoot all right. Him. Let's. Uh, one more time. <laughs> shoot. Uh, I, I just imagine that director just doing that. And him yeah. giving him the same take seven times. He's just like, ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> After that, Joe keeps telling Frank. Eventually, he does hit the next guy. And eventually, the Japan crashes and catches fire. And then one of the guys runs out on fire. So Joe and Frank puts him out. And the stock, stunt guy, not 100% positive, the camera is still running. And then Peggy congratulates them and tells them it calls for celebration. So Joe tells her he'll see her back at her place. And then they fuck. One of the I many sex scenes. Smash cut to it. Oh yeah. yeah, it's like not even yeah, just not even like a cross dissolve into a slow makeout scene. Just like boom, fucking. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta give us some warning, man. <laughs> I think the problem with this movie is it it wanted to be like a, a Skinamax film, you know? Yeah. It, it's yeah. so close to it. 
And yeah. I, I know why you're laughing. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I can't. I keep hiccuping. It's it's very embarrassing. But yeah, um, yeah that that's one of the the problems. It it wants to be a Skinamax film, but it, it doesn't have the balls to go, to go all the way. <laughs> sure. I I don't know if it was disturbing to me, but the fact that all the sex scenes happened in the middle of the day just seemed kind of off, like noon. <laughs> They're busy, man. They got stuff to do at night, and or the director doesn't have lights. Have lights. Either way, either one. It's that afternoon delight, man. Yeah, man. And have, as we get to later, having sex with your sliding glass door wide open and blinds drawn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you got to close the blinds. <laughs> but I, I do feel like that's like a drug kingpin's kind of mo. Sure. Like they're if yeah. they if they want to fuck, they're gonna do it. You know, rain, sleet, or shine. So so why not? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Okamura is definitely not going to be like, he's not going to be shy about it. No. And I, I, I kind of alluded to this prior to, to recording, but who was that scene for? <laughs> yeah. Okamura is an old, he's an old fat Japanese dude. And he's, he's getting it in with this attractive young lady. Yeah. Who's and that she- for? Yeah, and she was definitely the actress that probably had porn. I think she's the actress that drew the short straw. <laughs> yeah. I was I was saying more by how comfortable, you know, oh, she, she was. Comfortable. The... Come on, she's a professional actress, man. I mean, she's not the one that had to suck Robert to Dar's <laughs> 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 I, I, Robert to Dar's gargantuan head just <laughs> swallowing that poor girl's face. I will say the beard is a good look. Yeah. Oh, it's it's not bad. It helps. Yeah, it covers. Oh my god! Did does he? Did anyone teach him how to kiss? Because <laughs> he, like he's kissing everything but where he needs to kiss. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm surprised that the women are as attractive in this movie as they are. I'm not. I feel like this is exactly what. Really, I I feel like they were like I was expecting like. Even worse. T- to me, this was almost like a Jerry Seinfeld thing where, you know, Jerry's not a bad looking guy, but he shouldn't be scoring the type of women that he does. Oh, I'm talking about more in terms of what this movie should be able to. Oh, get. OK. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But then again, like, is this one of the things where you kind of if you're the director, you kind of promise these girls this is like the stepping stone to some, probably to yeah. something that could be better. You know, you, you show a little TNA. Who knows where that gets you? And unfortunately, where that got them was in this movie. So mm-hmm. they were lied to. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just me watching like these really terrible, uh, low budget horror movies on Amazon Prime that are like within the past 10 years. They all all the girls that they wind up in those movies that uh, wind up, you know, showing some sort of nudity. They all got a very specific look to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but these don't have it so maybe it's just maybe it's just that yeah these these girls are actually you know they're they're not bad they're yeah. I, they're they're uh, they're up there and they they show quite a bit yeah. we get we get full frontal at one point or another I, I think more than once if i remember yeah the redhead definitely shows full frontal yeah i think it might be just the redhead but yeah it's the the quality the quality is there yep yeah. i mean he's almost made a softcore porn so you you gotta, you gotta bring that. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that again, maybe that's what he was kind of looking for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at Fujiyama's house, Zadar briefs Fujiyama on Joe, says he's been trained in martial arts by the masters back east, and he speaks fluent Japanese, and that's why he's called Samurai. He also tells him that the that their guy is in the hospital, and Fujiyama tells him that he wants that witness's head. And then Joe and Frank go back to the precinct and get yelled at by the uh, the captain. And Joe sexually harasses a couple of women. And yeah. then okay. I was going to say the uh, the police office scene definitely showed someone that was like, why don't we make this like lethal weapon? <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah inside just, this little tiny office. Sure. Yeah. As the uh, production offices. Yeah. Uh, it, it's definitely is, it feels like a movie made by a guy that have, has seen all the movies that yeah. he's he's playing, but doesn't understand what makes them good. Yeah, right. Like so, simple, and my simple things like transition scene. Oh god, <laughs> and they're they're so jarring. Yeah. Like someone will get killed, 
and they'll they'll smash cut to two people two people making out. Yeah. Like, oh, geez, dude, you, you can't. <laughs> someone, this is kind of like filmmaking 101. There's gotta there's gotta be a buffer in there. <laughs> yeah. So then Joe and Frank head to the hospital to check in on the burned gangster and have one of the oddest interactions of all time with a nurse. She asked Frank straight out if she, uh, she asked Joe straight out if he'd like to fuck her. And she sticks her hand down his pants and tells him that she thinks his dick is too small. And then she leaves. Uh, if, if I'm Frank, I'm kind of jealous. Like, hey, like, what the fuck am I over here? Chop liver? Yeah. Like, why are we hitting on this guy? Doesn't have that glorious mane of hair. Oh, yeah. You know, to be honest, he does have very nice flowing locks of hair. But but just I, I feel like all of these women are just kind of th- throwing shade at Frank. And that that's not cool. Yeah. And Frank, Frank seemed pretty confident in what he was packing because he goes he almost chases after her. Yeah, he. I'm surprised he didn't, to be honest. Yeah. I'm surprised both of them aren't just getting hit on 24-7. Yeah. Well, I mean, we also – such an uncomfortable scene towards the end where the guy is about to cut Frank's dick off and he calls it a gift. Oh, that's a right. A black gift, he says. Oh, it, that's when uh, – what, Rob – Robert Zadar sends his, his goons after him, right? Yeah, to try and find uh, Joe's address. That's right. And then they have the, the scene with the other cop, Preacher. And then you get the really unnecessary nudity with the, was it the pre- wife. Was it Preacher or the captain? I thought it was the captain. Oh, I thought it was Preacher. I thought that's why the no, captain was, was so... Yeah. Oh, was it Preacher? I thought it was the captain. Yeah, they, he, for some reason, like, they, they pull the, the poor woman's blouse apart. And mm-hmm. then the, the, like, the next shot... It's covered up, so I I don't know whether like that was supposed to happen or that the one guy just got a little you know too ha- handsy. Yeah, but kind of like totally unnecessary. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, because the the captains in the end of the movie when they have their completely let's all turn in our badges after we murder a bunch of people. Yeah, well they don't yeah. kill preacher that though. No, they he stab gets him. stabbed. Yeah, they stab yeah. him, but he survives that that scene. So that's why I thought I thought that's why I thought the captain, because captain was like, I want you to kill fucking everyone. I want you to burn down their house and shit. That's why I thought it was the captain, because they just killed his wife. Yeah, not to it, say it, that he shouldn't take a couple of days off of work, but right. Yeah, I don't know if that, like I don't know if as a captain you're supposed to leave, supposed to outwardly say just murder everybody at, at yeah. least. At least hide it a little, dress it up. <laughs> well, that's why he says that we're probably gonna have to turn in our badges after this. But I don't think that do they? I don't remember. I just watched this movie. And they don't because they yeah. the last after they kill after Robert Zadar commits seppuku, uh, that's just uh, um, Joe fucking Jennifer on the beach. It's the end of the movie. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, again just a terrible. No one taught this guy this guy had to resolve movies I, I don't think i've ever seen a movie end on a sex scene <laughs> yeah i mean they're, they're they don't show anything it's just they're really making out more than anything okay. but yeah it's very jarring mm-hmm. um joe and frank uh the burn guy is too out of it to talk so they leave putting a few beat cops on security detail and then they leave as the beat cop starts chatting up one of the nurses he lets the red-headed woman the uh, gang member uh, Robert Sadar's gang dressed as a nurse wheel a trash cart into the room of the burn guy when she gets in Robert Sadar pops up out of the cart and cuts the guy's <laughs> head off via a katana that is that was a pretty great mo- reveal to see him in, like hunched down and <laughs> 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 this, this huge head comes out this giant man <laughs> hiding in a little a little cart yeah <laughs> uh, then Zadar pops back into the cart and she wheels it out they go to make their escape as the beat cop sees that the witness has been killed. They get approached by a few of the cops, all of them saying, hey, wait a minute. I, and then <laughs> Star beats the shit out of all of them. <laughs> Two things. My, the, the, I forgot. This is a great part. The cop, the actual cop, goes into the, the, uh, the room, sees the beheaded body, and then yells, get security. <laughs> You're the cop. <laughs> you are security. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... And when you were talking about how Zadar just beats the shit out of all these guys, like, hey, wait a minute. Ugh. Hey, yeah. wait a minute. Ugh. It reminded me of the scene in Airplane where the, uh, the, the the old captain or the colonel is going through the, the terminal. Yeah. And he keeps getting uh, he keeps being harassed by uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, like monks and all that. 
And every time one of them comes in, he just like flips them or punches them in the face. <laughs> like, Do you have time to talk about Jesus? Oh! It's like, like it's a, a direct parallel and it's so good. Hey, wait a minute. Ugh. Yeah, they all say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> like, like this guy is going to be taken down. Right. Like, it, he's going to come you quietly. You saw the guy before you just get absolutely yeah. annihilated. Excuse me, sir. Right. This time we'll, he'll stop. <laughs> uh, and then they drive away. Then Frank and Joe back at the prison get yelled at by their captain, which is just standard loose cannon talk, except when Joe's hair switches between his real hair and a wig from time to time. And also when Frank kisses the captain on the forehead and the camera hangs on longer than the actor expected. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Then Joe and Frank go to the Blue Lagoon restaurant where they know Fujiyama is having dinner. Fujiyama is there with Zadar, the redhead, a few other guys, and Fujiyama is giving gifts to a pretty blonde. And Joe and Frank start hassling Fujiyama, and his lawyer threatens to file a motion with the courts for some reason. And then Joe hits on the blonde and calls Fujiyama a geek. Then they have a, then they have a ridiculous conversation with the waiter that just tells us that the blonde is the owner of the restaurant, the owner of the restaurant's daughter. In the parking lot, Zadar sticks a couple of henchmen on Joe and Frank. Joe and Frank beat up a few of them up, much to the chagrin of Zadar. One of the henchmen pulls out a katana, so Frank shoots him in the shoulder, and Joe wrestles away the katana and then uses it to chop the arm off of one of the other henchmen that was threatening to shoot them. He throws the katana, first of all. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Right? He, he doesn't even just like do the swiping motion. He fucking throws it and cuts the henchman's arm off. <laughs> it's quite the scene. Yeah. Uh... I also liked how the, uh, <laughs> the, the henchmen are getting shot at with a fucking Uzi that Robert Zadar just pulls out of nowhere, apparently. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have enough for like proper squibs. So it, it almost looks like they're being th like tomatoes are being thrown on the henchmen when they're getting shot. Just like mm -hmm. little lips of red. It's almost like a paintball gun. <laughs> yeah. That one guy up against the, the car is just like, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> it's just not acting at all. Just like, all right, pretend you're being shot. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, next. <laughs> Everybody gets shot three times in this movie. Oh, is that? I didn't notice that. I, I, I'm just saying, like, I don't know if that's really true, but it's always like, boom. And they get, they stumble back, boom. Oh. They stumble back, and then boom. And then finally, I, the third one takes them down. I, I, I remember a scene. I, I think it's in the lab, the, the, uh, the photo lab. Yeah. There's a guy on the stairs. Yep. Uh, Joe shoots him three times <laughs> and just like point blank shoots him. Yep. And the guy, I don't think the guy knew when to like, remember in, I don't know. I mean, we've all seen Mortal Kombat, right? Mm -hmm. So do you remember when we they introduced on it? <laughs> yeah. Right. So re remember when they introduced Johnny Cage Yep. and he, he gives the guy a jumping roundhouse kick to the face. Yeah. He says, this is the part where you're supposed to fall down. That should have happened in this movie when he <laughs> shoots these henchmen. Right? You're like, you, you die now. Yeah. I shot you three times. You're you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Let me see this. So then Zadar takes out an Uzi and just starts shooting everyone, even his own men, and then throws a grenade under one of the cars and then leaves. And Joe and Frank celebrates the murders. Yeah. I <laughs> I don't understand with the a grenade when they toss it. Uh, I believe Joe and Frank run away and just leave the guy there. That they had yeah. handcuffed instead of grabbing him, you know, just let him blow up. Oh, well, he's probably dead at that point. I think it's just, oh, Zidar, yeah, that was the one that shot, shot everybody. Much. Yeah. And with, he with those little killed everyone with those really bad special effects things exploding on his shirt. Yeah. As he was shot. Yeah. But they they actually blow up the car, mm -hmm. which I was kind of surprised at. And and that's the first kind of awkward scene between Joe and Frank when they talk about Frank being black. Mm -hmm. He's going to charcoal your ass. I don't think you have to worry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then the, they high five over it. <laughs> I don't know if that's high five worthy, Frank. Yeah. Back to the precinct, the captain is having some sort of mental breakdown. And then Joe goes back to the restaurant to talk to Jennifer. Tries to figure out her relationship to Fujiyama. She tells him that Fujiyama helped out her and her mother after her father passed away. And Joe tells her that Fujiyama is dealing drugs. And they have a long conversation to try and get a date. She keeps blowing him off, telling him he's she's too busy or she's going to church. As Joe goes to leave, he gets accosted by a bunch of dudes in jumpsuits that have orders to break both his legs. So he beats the shit out of all of them. And then one of them runs away and he chases after him. And the uh, 
catches up to the guy and he threatens to break the guy's wrist until he tells him who sent him. He said it was Okamura, the bald, big bald guy. So Joe and Frank take Peggy with a few other officers over to where the the guys tell him Okamura lives. And I guess without a warrant because Frank is worried about the captain cutting his dick off. Peggy tells Frank to come to her place to use it before he gets cut off. Okamura is in his, in his bedroom about to fuck. Joe tells him to freeze and then struggles with a sliding glass door, giving Okamura a chance to escape. Frank shoots some dudes and Joe chases after Okamura. And then Joe and Okamura have a martial arts fight, with Joe switching between his real hair and his wig. At one point, Okamura even pulls off the wig. Eventually, Joe manages to break Okamura's arm and they arrest him. But as they try to put the handcuffs on him, he tries to take Frank's gun and Joe shoots him first, killing him. And they said, well, that's another one that's dead. (laughs) (laughs) We're just just racking up a body count here. (laughs) Then Zadar has a meeting with Fujiyama and tells him about all the cops on the force that have been a problem. So Zadar says that they should kill the cops if they won't be bought. They decide they're going to get their New York friends to pay Samurai Cop a visit and try to break his legs. Those guys come and they find him getting some film developed and shootout ensues. Zadar and the redhead lady are about to fuck, but he gets called by Fujiyama and has to leave. Joe shows up at Jennifer's church and tells her that he has to take her in for some questioning. And he winds up bringing her to his house. Sadar goes to Fujiyama and tells him that Jennifer left the church with the cop, and Fujiyama tells him to kill him. Joe makes Jennifer dinner and makes a joke about how he killed the chicken himself from his neighbor's chickens. Then Sadar and his goons go to the cap. Uh, I guess this is, uh, what's his name, Preacher's house, and demands him to tell him where to find Samurai Cop. When he doesn't tell him, Sadar slashes the wife's throat with a katana and then stabs the captain in the gut, or preacher in the gut. Zadar tells his men to go to Washington's place, and he's going to go to Peggy's to find out where Joe lives. Meanwhile, Joe and Jennifer are in swimsuits making out on the beach. Not sure where Jennifer got the suit, as she came straight from church. I think he just keeps... I mean, he's just constantly banging, right? Yeah, it's true. He probably has a a woman's wardrobe. This looks like your size. And I think he only has one size of women, apparently. Probably. It it doesn't seem like that's a big problem. (laughs) Again, like... We just watched we watched someone get murdered, and now oh, we're yeah. on the beach watching these two about to bone. Yeah, it's it, while everybody else around him is die, dying or almost getting killed because of him. Right, he's just fucking. Yeah, like, this is just a regular day. Like oh, I got my my three o'clock fuck session. <laughs> <laughs> because that's when the light is exactly right in this room. <laughs> right. Time waits for no man. <laughs> Then two goons show up at Frank's as he's getting out of the shower. They threaten to cut his dick off unless he tells him Joe's address. Tells him it's in his jacket pocket, so while one of the guys tries to find it, Frank manages to get a pair of scissors off the table. Turns the tables on the guys holding a knife to his throat. He manages to grab the guy's gun and shoot the other one, then knifes the guy in the throat. Meanwhile, Joe and Jennifer are now in the pool. Then Frank t- tries to call Joe to give him a heads up, but he's in the pool, so he's not answering. Meanwhile, Zadar and some of his men show up to Peggy's house as she's making herself some food. They sneak in through the window, and she manages to fight a few of them off at first, but Zadar manhandles her, and his men hold her down. He then takes a pan of grease off the stove and pours boiling grease on Peggy until she tells him where Joe lives. Eventually, he winds up pouring the whole thing on her, even though she gives him the address. Meanwhile, Joe brings Jennifer a cake while he's in the tiniest briefs ever, and then they fuck. Uh, did, did you notice in the uh, the scene with Peggy, when I think she opens the, the drawer... She opens the drawer twice. There's two different guns. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, because the second time she opens it, it's a revolver. I think the first time it, it looks like an automatic. Yeah. It's. She uh, also takes the frying pan and opens up the freezer. And I was like, <laughs> that's I was like what's she about goes? to do? <laughs> <laughs> she gonna put it in the freezer? She's she's gonna put that grease in the freezer. <laughs> and, that was kind of and, a, that was a tough scene to watch, to be honest with you. And, and you're yeah. we never see her again for the whole movie. Yeah. For the rest of the movie, we don't know what happened to her. She presumably Frank or not, Joe doesn't want to bang her anymore because she has burns all over her body. Yeah, but we yeah, standards. Yeah, like oh, listen, sorry, Peggy. Uh, I kind of need you to be flawless. Yeah, uh, <laughs> gotta cut you off the stable here. Like, like, damn, like what happened? Yeah, Frank eventually gets a, Frank. So they fuck, and Frank eventually gets a hold of Joe just as Zadar and his men arrive at the house. Joe gets dressed and gets his gun and heads outside as the goons are sneaking around. He shoots a few of them, but then retreats back into the house and then goes through the front into the car and they drive away. 
Jennifer then goes back to the restaurant and talks to her mom as if she wasn't just in a gunfight. <laughs> her mom tells her that Fujiyama had something planned for her birthday and was mad that she disappeared for the day. And Jennifer says that she doesn't give a damn. But then Fujiyama comes in as he uh, and hears her say that, and he is very pissed. Back at the precinct, the captain gives the guys permission to kill everyone to get to Fujiyama, but also says they'll probably have to turn in their badges after. So they go to Fujiyama's compound. Fujiyama puts his men on high alert, and a gunfight ensues. Joe and Frank blast their way through the house. Eventually, they make it to Fujiyama, but he holds Jennifer hostage. He tells them to drop their weapons or he'll kill Jennifer. They do, then Fujiyama immediately shoots Frank. Imme- like, why shoot Frank first? You're right. Shoot that, Samurai Cop. That, that's happened twice in this movie, where uh, Okamura gets the drop on Frank. And, and, like, why wouldn't you shoot Frank there now, right? Because you have Frank right next to you. You mean Joe? No, he uh, Okamura gets the drop on Frank, right? He pulls Frank's gun out, and he goes mm. to shoot Joe. But right. there, it should be you shoot Frank, right? Because you have him right next to you. Or you can use him as a hostage. But he has he has Jennifer hostage. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, why wouldn't you just use Frank as a hostage in that one scene? I, I, I guess Okamura. I don't. Not not in this scene. The earlier scene with Okamura is with Dan. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So when the the scene when they they watch him getting ready to nail this poor unfortunate girl and <laughs> right like he he was like oh watch like just be careful because I think I broke his arm but he he gets the drop on Frank right. right? So at that point, why are you not using Frank as a shield? Right. I don't know. It makes no sense. Yeah. But Fujiyama should shoot Joe. Yes. 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 Now yeah, he right? should. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so he goes to shoot. Uh, so he shoots uh, Frank. He goes to shoot Joe, but Jennifer tries to wrestle the gun away, giving Frank enough time to get up and shoot Fujiyama to death. Because Frank was wearing a bulletproof vest. As the finals stand, Joe and Frank go to Zadar's house. Frank shoots a dude with a katana, and it alerts all the dudes with mullets. They skulk around the property, trading fire with the goons, killing a few here and there. And eventually Zadar and the redhead show up. And Joe kills the redhead, and a bunch of people get shot and die. And then Joe and Zadar face off with katanas. Once again, the wig comes in and out of the scene. Eventually, they both lose their swords and have to fist fight. Eventually, Joe manages to best Zadar by apparently breaking his neck. Um, but Zadar doesn't stop moving around. He tells Joe to kill him via the code of the Bushido. But as Joe is about to, Frank reminds him that he's a cop, which probably could have said a few hundred dead bodies ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, forgot about that. So he won't kill him, but Zadar takes the knife out of his pocket and commits seppuku instead. And then Joe and Jennifer go to the beach and make out and to fuck, I assume. And that's the end of the movie. Yeah, he's he's already moved on from Peggy. Yeah, he's not even going to visit her in the hospital. Poor Peggy. She, Why does she get the worst out of everybody? <laughs> I feel like Peggy doesn't have any sense of self-worth, to be honest. Probably. Right, because she's looking to just nail anybody who's in that police precinct. Like, even married dudes. Say, hey, preacher, you want to fuck? I'm married. I'm so, I don't give a shit. It's like, <laughs> hey, come on, Peggy, you're better than that. You deserve better. Yeah, poor Peggy. I- I also enjoy how in the beginning we're told that Joe is fluent in Japanese. I don't think he utters a single word of Japanese in this movie. He says <laughs> katana. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and means Japanese sword. <laughs> Does he say samurai? He might not even say samurai in this movie. <laughs> I don't think so. I think everybody else does. Yeah, everyone else calls him samurai. That, it, that might be one of my underrated favorite parts is the katana thing. Means Japanese sword. <laughs> means Japanese sword. <laughs> oh man, this guy's worth every penny. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's such a mess. That's what this movie is, really. <laughs> uh, I I feel in, you know how sometimes in a movie you could be like, yeah, it was a mess, but you could feel that there's something there, like kind of like with an M Night Shyamalan movie, like it's a mess, it's a train wreck, but you can sense that something. There was there was a good story underneath all this crap that that's nowhere to be. You could dig forever and you wouldn't find a good story here. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, it was fun in parts, but it was kind of boring in a lot of parts, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, in, in terms of like bad movies, I think this is worse than Double Down in terms of fun factor. Sure. I think so. Because right? at least with Double Down, it, it's just so absurd yeah. that. You you find levity in it, whereas these guys are just so goddamn serious. 
<laughs> and so goddamn bad yeah. that you can't even have fun with it. <laughs> you just kind of like, ah, uh, you, you, this was a slog at times. I'm like, when is this going to get good? Like, bad good. When is that going to happen? Right. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got nothing else, really. You guys yeah. want to plug your shit? Sure. Uh, just real quick at Diaquino122. That's my Twitter account. Uh, you could also follow our Real Play D&D podcast, Stranger Damies, on there. We post when we are uh, when we have new episodes, when we're streaming, and we just talk general D and D, cosplaying, stuff like that. I mean, we're I I know it's kind of early now, but we're gonna be at New York Comic Con. We're gonna be checking out all the cosplay. We're gonna be checking out D and D stuff. So if you listen to us, if you go there, we'll be there. We'll be hanging. Yeah. So our podcast, as you mentioned, Stranger Damies, airs every other Wednesday. Um, we also stream our sessions live over at twitch.tv slash Game Vault Pod. Um, be sure to check us out. That's every other Friday. Um, and then on every other Monday is the Game Vault Podcast, which is our video game um, conversation and news, uh, show that we do. Um, and then over at twitch.tv slash Game Vault Pod, we stream about five days a week. Well, uh, Wednesday right now is Apex Legends, but I think we might be changing it um, either uh Probably next week, um, either the week coming up or next week. Um, Tom's trying to convince us to do Halo. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, on Thursday is my uh, continuing Paper Mario stream. Um, and then Friday, again, we alternate recording the podcast and um, uh, Stranger Damies. Uh, Saturday um, is usually going to be my chill stream. Um, so there may or may not be something there. It'll probably be at 2 p.m. Um, on Saturday, 60-something. So just keep an eye on the Twitter. Um, and then Sundays, um, same thing with Dan. Um, he plays uh, Breath of the Wild. The show is called Dan of the Wild. Um, so just keep an eye on the Twitter, um, which is uh, at Game Vault Pod on all socials. And then Monday is our um, stream where we, uh, on the days we have a podcast drop, we play our Retro Roulette game. And then on the days we do not, um, Tom plays through an RPG. Um, we should be finishing up Sweeken and um, this week coming up and add to something else. Okay, great. And this is They Called This Movie. You can find us at They Called... You could find us on Spreaker just by searching They Called This Movie. We're also available on all podcast streaming apps. Just search They Called This Movie and we'll pop right up. Uh, TheMainDamy.com is our main website. You can find us at TheMainDamy.com and on all socials just by searching the main Damie. So That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search they call just search the main name and we will pop right up. We're also a proud member of Geek Vibes Nation. You can find us at gvnation.com and on all socials and all podcast streaming apps. Just look for Geek Vibes Nation. Tons of great shows. If you're into geek stuff, surely there's a show for you. And that's going to wrap us up this week. The director of Samurai Cop was Amir Shervan. So for Dan Aquino and Mark Myers, this is Anthony Delvecchio telling Amir Shervan, well, you certainly made a movie, didn't you? Only on Peacock. John Wayne Gacy killed 32. Straight from the killer's mouth. They want you to believe that I alone committed these murders. The new gripping six-part documentary series, John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. What do you know about Dr. Dunch? Based on the unbelievable true story. I can't make sense of this. Dr. Death. Dunch has two deaths that we know of. Starring Joshua Jackson with Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin. I am going to fix you. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock.